morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, how are you all? My name is Mosamo Erani, and I am here with the singular honor of taking you through today's program of the Three Minute uh, Thesis Competition, the University of the Free State League. I hear that congratulations are in order already for if all the um, contestants who are here today because you've won within your faculties. And I hope uh, we will have a great day today and that I wish you all of the best. Uh, today we are going to go through all of you know the presentations as we all know, but first I have to call upon Prof. Uh, Witness Musi, who is going to welcome us into um, this particular program, as well as welcome Prof. Koli uh, Vitan, who is our Vice Rector for Research and Internationalization. Prof. Musi. Thank you, Musa. Thank you. Um, good morning. It's that exciting time of the year again when we get to hear all about the exciting research that is happening within our faculties. But before I do that, I would like to acknowledge Prof. Kohli, who is my line manager, for gracing us with your presence. Prof. Kohli, for those that don't know, if you don't, then there's a problem. She's the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research and um, Internationalization. So she is very much invested uh, in the research that you guys do and is interested in hearing all the good stuff that we've been doing. Um, let me also acknowledge the judges that are here. Uh, we know it's um, never an easy time for you to take time off your busy schedules to be with us, but we really appreciate it. And I would also like to acknowledge the staff from the Center for Graduate Support. Um, there's a lot of background work that goes into coming up with this program, believe me. There's a lot that goes on. Until we reach this stage, there's always a lot of work that needs to be done. But the most important people are the participants. I would like to welcome you to this day because it's your day. And we are eager to hear you know, the exciting research that you embarked on during the course of the year. And um, the audience, of course, those that are here, and we are also streaming this event live. Uh, those that are also online, you are also welcome. It's going to be an interesting morning when we get to hear about the studies that our fellow masters and PhD students at the University of the Free State have engaged in. What is the 3MT competition? The three minute thesis competition is a borrowed concept that was started by the University of Queensland in 2008. And its enthusiasm has grown, honestly, worldwide. It is now a worldwide phenomenon uh, with even international competitions. We, as the University of the Free State, acquired the, host, uh, the rights to host this competition in South Africa. Um, that was in 2013 when we started um, uh, mulling this idea. And then we had the first competition in 2016. And we have not stopped since. It, it doesn't only stop there. Um, I'm quite sure you've already heard that we have got winners today at master's level, at PhD level from the various faculties. Um, the winners of the PhD from today will then represent us at the national competition where we will then have other universities also competing. So is, there's still a bit more to go. I think that is on the 28th. The 28th of this month, that's when we are going to host the national three minute thesis competition. So, it's going to be an exciting time. What is the concept behind the three minute thesis competition? Well, it's a platform that challenges you to talk about your research to people that are not from your discipline in a manner that they can understand. All being done in three minutes, using only one slide. So that's really the basic concept of the three-minute thesis competition. They always say the best teachers are those that are able to simplify complex issues in a manner that anybody can understand. And that is what you are being challenged to do today, to simplify for us those complex studies that you have done, but in a manner that when you all leave here, we'll be having a clear understanding of what it is that you did and what you found as far as your study is concerned. Um, obviously, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic um, sort of 
gave us the momentum to really utilize um, the various modes of uh, communication available to us. We do have participants that will be presenting online today, and we even have the same models operandi for the national competition as well. I think it's something that we have to embrace going forward, that we always have these hybrid things where we have got some that will be here physically, but others that will also be participating online. It's something that I think will be with us forever. Um, there are fantastic prizes to be won, ladies and gentlemen, today. I think in the master's category, I think the winners, if I'm not mistaken, will walk away with 8,000 runs cash, the first run-up with 6,000 runs, and the third run-up with 4,000 runs. And um, the PhDs, the winner will walk away with 10,000 runs, and the first run-up with 8,000 runs, and the second run-up with 6,000 runs. And the money is even more for the national competition for the PhD guys. I think the winner walks away with around 18,000 runs. I have to cross-check, but there's quite a bit of money to be won. Um, I will not take a lot of your time. My role as symbol is to welcome all of you and to wish the participants all the best. May the best woman, gentlemen, please win. Thank you. But of course, before I leave, I have got the singular honor of inviting my line manager to talk to us um, on the essence of postgraduate research, Prof. Colin. Good morning, uh, everyone. I'm going to keep this short in, in line with what we have here today, short, concise, uh, to the point, uh, at talks, so you know it's often hard for academics to kind of stick to the points. They are really one long-winded sometimes, often, uh, especially in the humanities. Sorry for those of you who come from the humanities and social sciences. Who? Okay, so here we go. Good morning, everyone. Uh, most importantly, good morning to the presenters. Uh, I'm looking forward to your talks uh, and to your support as well. I met some of the support people sitting in front of me, so welcome to you and thank you for supporting your friends and colleagues and fellow students. Um, to the judges, welcome. To the staff of the Centre for Graduate Support, thank you and, and good morning. Um, and of course to all the other staff and people online, thank you for joining us. I'd like to ask the following question. Is a postgraduate qualification still relevant today? There has recently been a focus on long, long life or, or long life or lifelong learning, uh, and one of the exciting spin-offs of the pandemic and the isolation that we had to endure during the pandemic is the explosion of online courses and training opportunities. I've recently used one of the online opportunities in my personal capacity, as I'm a very enthusiastic, not so serious and very unknowledgeable birder. So yesterday, I joined uh, an online course on the identification of locks uh, in Afrikaans, Lieverica, uh, which I knew nothing about. They're all small and brown. So, <laughs> um, so these training courses definitely weren't available when, when before the pandemic hit. You had to sort of uh, meet with these birding guides in person, and that has created a lot of learning opportunities uh, post the pandemic. By the way, what did I learn? Uh, there are 20 lark species, they're brown and small. So, <laughs> is lifelong learning a replacement for postgraduate studies? Uh, what did my doctorate mean to me in my own career, and how does lifelong learning contribute to employability? Um, perhaps the lock course doesn't rock my work environment, um, but it certainly was a lot of fun. It is common knowledge that postgraduate studies prepare students better for employment. In fact, that graduates with postgraduate qualifications are more employable, they find quicker jobs, uh, and get paid more than those who only have undergraduate degrees or those who do not have degrees at all. We also know that there's a constant change in the workplace, 
Um, and that's the only constant thing is that changing workforce and workplace. But the pandemic also reminded us how quickly we can adjust to a changing environment in the workplace. The world seamlessly switched from which switched to working from home, shopping more online, meeting and making decisions online, uh, and dealing with dis disruptions in supply chains. Individuals with postgraduate qualifications are definitely better suited to navigate these constant workplace shifts to take on new learning opportunities with ease and confidence and reinvent themselves. The constant changing work environment is also the reason why this three-minute thesis competition is so important. Today, you must convey a comprehensive and meaningful message in just three minutes. You must present the information well and entice the audience. You must summarize complex research information into a single useful slide. These communication skills will remain critically important no matter how the world of work changes. We are now only starting to see the impact of the pandemic. There are talks of global recession, a drastic fall in the value of the British pound, high global inflation, uh, and pressure on disrupted supply chains. <laughs> Less money is currently going around and jobs are, incre are increasingly competitive in a very uncertain labor market uh, at the moment. You must prepare yourself to compete uh, for employment opportunities that will cross your career path. Um, taking part in this competition this morning will certainly be, will, will provide you with useful tools to put into your future work toolbox. Postgraduate qualifications are also very important to universities worldwide. So it's not just for students, but also important in the university environment. Uh, it is with these postgraduate degrees that we create new knowledge uh, and that we impact our society. It is the creation of new knowledge and the impact of our research that builds the reputation of the university. Um, so I always teach the teaching and learning side to say, you know, the research is actually builds the reputation. Um, so, but they don't believe me. I hope you believe me. Uh, Ms. Daniela um, Vessels uh, from the Center of Graduate Support shared a story with me about how postgraduate studies impacted the life of Ms. Lungi Langa. Um, Lungi was a UFS student and she described her postgraduate studies as a game changer. And I'd like to share her story with you uh, in closing this, this morning. She says, here's her story and this is what she says. I had a small office in a restaurant where I did payroll sheets and personal record filing. I was done with my work by 11 a.m. and joined the rest of the staff in preparing and selling hamburgers. She continued this for five years as Lanka searched for work uh, in her preferred field. She says, I decided to register for a postgraduate diploma in HR management and the doors finally started to open for me. I secured my first job as a human resource assistant. My BA degree was just too general and I think this was partly why I could not land my desired job in human resources. But after I registered for my postgraduate diploma, everything changed. The postgraduate diploma changed my life in that it was more specific than my undergraduate degree. And after many years of trying, I was finally able to get the job and have the career I wanted. Langa was promoted to the HR manager and then headhunted for a consulting position at a big insurance firm. She was quickly promoted and climbed the corporate ladder. While working at the insurance firm, she decided to further her studies, completing an honors degree in industrial psychology, followed by a master's degree in psychology before qualifying as an industrial psychologist. She says, my postgraduate studies created more opportunities for me, and today I own my own industrial psychology practice and consulting firm. And I think that's the power of postgraduate studies. Um, so, so that's a real life story that I thought would be interesting to you and maybe a little bit motivational. Postgraduate qualifications do really change lives. Perhaps it's obvious for me as an academic, um, but the 
the in my own career, the opportunities that I had because of a master's and doctoral degree uh, were really numerous. Um, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to have completed those degrees. Good luck to each of you uh, on your own studies. Uh, and I look forward to hearing uh, what you have to present this morning. Good luck to the presenters. And again, thank you to the staff of the Centre for Graduate Support for arranging this uh, amazing event. Thank you. Thank you, witness. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you so much, Prof. I would like to introduce you, please, before we begin our proceedings to our judges. And then following that, I'll invite Ria onto the stage to take us through an explanation of today's proceedings. And then the real action will begin. So um, our judges are firstly Prof. Witness Musi, who is the director of the Center for Graduate Support. We also have Mr. Jose Rekwani, who is a lecturer in anthropology department uh, within the Faculty of Humanities. We also have Prof. Mohele Mahalwa, who's an associate professor in the Faculty of Education. And then finally, Dr. Walter Janse van Rensburg, who's a senior lecturer at School of Biomedical Sciences in the Faculty of Health Sciences. Round of applause for our judges. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to invite Rihanna to just uh, take us through today's proceedings. Okay, thank you, Musa. Um, good morning to everyone that is here, the audience, the participants, and the judges. So what will happen um, with today's proceedings? We will call your name and announce your three-minute thesis title. You will then come and have three minutes to present. You will have a timer on your um, slide that will show you how long you have, but we do have someone who will just, um, by show of a paper, let you know when you have one minute left, 30 seconds left, and when your time is up. Please do be aware that should you go over the three-minute mark, you will automatically be, be disqualified. So please be um, mindful of your time. The judges will be taking your scores, and then they will also write um, their comments on the scores. So should you want to um, clarify on that, we can do that after the session. And then um, we will give the judges about two minutes to ask you questions. So once you're done presenting, please do not leave so that then the judges can ask um, questions if they want to clarify on anything. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Ria, for that. So first up, so first up, <laughs> I'm as nervous as you guys. <laughs> first up is Ruth Hadebe from the Natural and Agricultural Sciences Faculty. She is going to be presenting her three-minute thesis titled The Economic Value of Root Accessible Water Table Information. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I am here to present my research study titled The Economic Value of Root Accessible Water Table Information. Indeed, that sounds like a mouthful. So let me break it down to you. Water. Water is life. Water is important to everyone in this room. Water is important to industries. And irrigated agriculture is not an exception. But if you think about it, water is so important that it has no alternative. It is practically irreplaceable. Yet, there are a lot of scenarios and predictions around water scarcity and the impact it has on semi-arid countries like South Africa. We turn to irrigated agriculture for the solution because irrigated agriculture uses the bulk of available water resources both in South Africa and worldwide. 65% in South Africa and 70% worldwide. Interestingly enough, in most irrigation soils, there's a presence of a root accessible water table that is involuntarily accessed by crops. According to research, these root uh, accessible water tables can contribute to about 40% of the water requirements during the growing season. However, farmers or irrigators do not use information about root accessible water tables to schedule irrigation. Therefore, the main objective of the study is to convince irrigators to use root accessible water tables in conjunction with surface water so that they can be able to um, reduce their less applied water with the hope that they can gain some economic benefit from it. The tools that are used are all embedded in a value of information framework, which includes bioeconomic modeling that evaluates the different financial implications of not using root accessible water and using accessible water. At 
at the end, I hope that farmers, will, uh, irrigators will be able to use um, water sparingly while saving their cost and increasing their margins. Of course, there's a lot of work that needs to be done and um, currently, although the, crop, the crops that I mainly use are wheat and maize, further expansion is expected on including perennial crops and um, other aspects like that. In case everything happens, we need to turn to irrigated agriculture for the solution because water is life. Thank you. Just a quick one. Yes. Is this study started? Yes, it has. Okay. Do mm. we have any findings? Um, currently, I'm running my results. So the water application has reduced to about, in different scenarios, 40 to 50 percent, which reduces their electricity cost quite um, uh, large. But I haven't, I haven't gotten to the part where I actually quantify the exact. So I'm going to build. I'm in the process of building a, a differential evolutionary algorithm that will optimize, like give me the best economic value or the best gross margin that the farmers can. Um, obtain should they use um, root accessible water tables. So I'm currently in that part. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Short. Um, thank you very much. Um, a technical question. How do they determine where the, the water table is? Okay. So currently I'm using um, a crop growth model called SWAP, which is Soil, Water, Atmosphere and Plant, which was de uh, developed in the Netherlands, um, Wageningen University. So that's the one that simulates um, all the root accessible water tables. And then what I do with the differential evolutionary algorithm that is embedded in the bioeconomic modeling process is that I'll link that same model and then link it to my economic model to make the various analysis. Because what that model will give me is the irrigation amounts for each scenario, whether the farmer uses root accessible water tables or not. And then I just link that to the economics. Thank yeah. you very much. You're welcome. Any other questions Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth. It's clear that we're going to have an incredible morning of learning and interaction. I'm very excited. The next presenter is going to be Bernadette Belter from the Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Sciences as well. And her three-minute three thesis title is, is, at least you don't have COVID. <laughs> Thank you. So since 2020, we have all been faced with a global COVID-19 pandemic. And while many have lost their lives, others have suffered great economic impacts as well as health-related issues. As such, there has been a race to develop safe and effective vaccines against the causative agent, SARS-CoV-2. And while many vaccines are in production, some such as Pfizer and Moderna are mainly based on mRNA vaccines, which are very unstable and breaks in transport as well as storage conditions can actually limit their efficacy. So we will be looking at producing uh, proteins for the potential use in subunit vaccines. So these are often more stable and elicit a greater immune response. So how will we go about producing these proteins? Well, we will take a piece of DNA that is responsible for producing the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 and add this to our yeast. This yeast will then express the protein in a way similar as it would be in the host, which would be us in this case. We will then, this is then safer and often elicits a greater immune response, but also produces the protein to a greater uh, volume. Then we will purify this protein from other proteins or contaminants in the yeast and use this in a solution or adjuvant in order to produce potential vaccines. Once we inject this into our bodies, this then stimulates the immune response and antibodies will be produced against the spike protein. These antibodies are specialized Y-shaped proteins that will bind to the body's foreign invaders via lock and key mechanism. Once these antibodies have been produced, if we come into contact with the whole virus, the antibodies will then bind to these spike proteins on the surface of the virus and thereby neutralize it and it will not be able to infect us anymore. 
We will then also be able to use this in diagnostics if you have not been vaccinated previously because your body will naturally have produced antibodies and these will then be able to bind to our proteins of interest. Thereby you can test positive or negative. And then you'll be able to say at yeast you don't have COVID. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> so, very hot topic currently. So, um, what is the storage conditions for proteins? Um, because I know that's a problem with the current ones, uh, four degrees versus minus 20 versus room temperature. Yes, so many of the subunit vaccines that are based on proteins can be stored at four degrees Celsius or uh, negative 20 degrees Celsius for long-term storage whereas your mRNA vaccines need to be stored at minus 80, um, also for a f short time period. So proteins are, in essence, more stable than your mRNA. Thank you. So, so the first time I picked up on the immune system was probably the last. Wh why is it not actually a found in principle? Because we, my, my immune system, hair immune system, his immune system, it's probably different, right? Am mm -hmm. I getting that incorrectly? Um, could you maybe rephrase? So we, we, I picked up immune system response here. Yes. Um, and I didn't really see it from, from that particular process. Yes, so the main focus of the project is the expression of the protein first in the yeast expression system. And then this could potentially be used to stimulate the immune response later down the line. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Bernadette. Um, we're still going to continue, and our next speaker is Anne Church from the Economic and Management Sciences, and her title is The Audit Expectation Gap, a Private Company Perspective. What is the phrase that often pops up in discussions on sign-off, ESCOM, the Guptas, and all of these scandals? Where were the auditors? Mm -hmm. The public has certain expectations from auditors, but are these expectations realistic? Are auditors negligent, complacent, or is there a poor understanding of what auditors do? All of this has led to a significant amount of research on what we call the audit expectation gap. Now, all of this research has focused solely on public listed companies, but the economic importance of private companies cannot be underestimated. Globally, private companies contribute significantly towards the economy, especially in developing countries like South Africa. In my qualitative study, I interviewed 26 users of private company financial statements, which included members of management, shareholders, the banks, and SARS. The aim was to obtain a detailed understanding of what these users expect from auditors and to see how these expectations compare to international auditing standards. I found that an audit expectation gap most definitely does exist, but that it was much smaller compared to public listed companies. The apparent reason? Compromised independence. Independence is the single most important quality of an auditor. It enhances credibility and trustworthiness. But independence is subjective, and in private companies, the boundaries are pushed. The benefit of this reduced independence was that members of management and shareholders generally had a good understanding of what an audit entails, and they were very satisfied with the service they got from the auditors. But this was because of the auditors' extensive involvement in these companies. Private companies get much more from their auditors than just an audit report. Audits of private companies were found to be synonymous with long-standing relationships, personal relationships, and a general familiarity between auditor and client. This was supported by statements like, my auditor and I are like brothers, or I view my auditor as my second financial manager. But what does this say for the external users of private company financial statements, the banks and SARS? They rely on this independent auditor's report. 
but do they have a false sense of security? The study will contribute to a guide for auditors on how to manage the audit expectation gap in private companies without compromising independence, and hopefully this can contribute to restoring the reputation of the auditing profession. In private companies, the auditors are there, but perhaps a bit too much. Thank you. <laughs> Questions. Okay. <laughs> no questions. That's incredible. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anne. That was obviously very clear. <laughs> Thank you so much to all our three presenters so far. You guys are doing incredible work um, solving contemporary challenges with impactful and very relevant research. Our next presenter, though, is going to be Jen Marie Grover from the Health Sciences, and she is going to uh, take us through TP53, the Cancer Police. Thank you for the introduction. The TP53, or tumor protein gene, acts as the body's cancer police by regulating the process of cell division. It ensures that cells do not grow or divide too fast or uncontrollably. However, some powerful criminals known as mutations or changes in the gene can inactivate TP53, resulting in cancer running rampant in the body. TP53 mutations, especially in blood cancers, are associated with a more aggressive form of cancer and indicate poor survival for the patient, as these patients typically do not respond to the standard treatment. It is thus important to screen for TP53 mutations, as the prevalence in Central South Africa is currently unknown. However, the current detection methods have some limitations in terms of time, cost, and labor. Thus, a rapid and cost-effective screening method is desired. In this study, we screened 60 participants with various blood cancers for TP53 mutations using two established methods. Fluorescent in situ hybridization, or FISH, was used to detect a deletion of the entire gene, while Sanger sequencing was used to screen the area of the gene where most mutations are typically found. Um, subsequently, we optimized and implemented a screening method known as high-resolution melting, or HRM analysis. HRM is a fast and effective tool that recognizes differences in gene sequences based on how these sequences behave when the temperature is gradually increased. Lastly, we investigated the clinical impact of TP53 mutations by comparing the clinical characteristics of the TP53 positive and negative participants. Remarkably, TP53 mutations had a higher prevalence than expected of 26.67%. The 16 mutations detected were prevalent in each of the six different blood cancers investigated, as depicted by the table. 12 participants had a deletion of the entire gene, while four had mutations within the gene that caused the protein form to be non-functional. One of the four mutations was identified to be novel or new in blood cancers. The participants with mutations showed signs of aggressive disease and had a poor treatment response compared to those without mutations. The screening method was successfully optimized and was able to detect 100% of mutations as identified by the established Sanger sequencing method. In conclusion, we provide an optimized and val validated screening method for TP53 mutations. And we also emphasize the importance of incorporating TP53 mutation screening in patient management. Thank you. Are there any questions from professor? Thank you for the uh, interesting study. Just a quick one. So how cost effective is this new way of screening? Is it something that can easily be implemented to the general public? Yes, so the current methods, um, so we're addressing a current gap that there is um, in the testing scope of, the, of these mutations because the current method um, is Sanger sequencing, which it's not actually being implemented. There's actually a much more expensive method that's implemented, which is called a next generation sequencing. But that includes a whole array of genes, so you can't specifically only focus on TP53, which sometimes is the case. We want that as a sole method. So. Sanger sequencing already compared to high resolution melting is quite, um, if I can say it, uh, HRM is about, let's say, if I can say a quarter of the price of Sanger sequencing, so this will definitely have implications and it's 
it's feasible to implement it. Oh, that's good. So it's not the food we are eating, it's, it's the mutations. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, have you, um, you say that you validated the screening method. Um, is it already implemented in your diagnostic workup? Thank you for the question. Um, we are in the process of implementing it. So we performed another validation study in the laboratory. Um, so we're in the process of getting approval from the hematology expert committee to implement it. Any other questions? Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, John Murray. Our next presenter is going to be Tando Kutlegama from the Health Sciences Faculty as well. And her topic is HPLC, TLC, and GCMS fingerprinting of cannabinoids from extracts of unknown cannabis sativa one samples. Can you tell? I practiced and practiced. Welcome. <laughs> Cannabis is a controversial plant that is widely used in different cultures as a medicinal or recreational drug. It is separated into two main types, which differ according to their chemical content and their uses. Hemp, which is mainly used for its fiber, contains more of a chemical known as cannabidiol or CBD. Marijuana, which is also known as medical cannabis, contains more of tetrahydrocannabinol or THC. In 2018, the private use of cannabis was decriminalized in South Africa. However, its public use, growth, and distribution still remain illegal and is monitored by the use of a permit system. There are two different permits for the two different types of cannabis. Now, hemp and marijuana cannot be told apart by just looking at the plant, which presents an opportunity for any chance takers looking to abuse their permits. The aim of this project, therefore, was to develop a fast, reliable and cost-effective method to chemically distinguish between hemp and marijuana through the use of chromatography techniques. The second part of the project was to determine whether or not the ethanolic extract of cannabis is toxic to human kidney cells. An unknown cannabis sample from Velcom was extracted and analyzed using chromatography techniques TLC, HPLC and GCMS. From the results, it was confirmed that the unknown sample was, in fact, marijuana. It was found to contain approximately 0.08% of CPD and 0.3% of CBN. Furthermore, the ethanolic extract of cannabis was found to be non-toxic to human kidney cells at the tested concentrations up to 100 microgram per mil. Finally, a fast, reliable, and cost-effective method to chemically distinguish between hemp and marijuana was developed. This simple method can be further adapted for use by police to monitor, to monitor permit compliance among citizens. So let's say during a roadblock, a police official stops a citizen transporting a truckload of cannabis. Now they cannot tell by just looking at the plants whether it is marijuana or hemp. However, through the use of this simple method, they can now do a fast on-the-spot test to detect whether the cannabis sample that is being transported corresponds to the, permit, to the cannabis type that is mentioned in the permit. Secondly, this method can be used by the medicines regulatory body, SAPRA, to ensure that cannabis products meet the global narcotics quota. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, how long does it take to, to make a plant extract? Okay, thank you for the question. Using the extraction method known as quetches, it would take around three minutes to five minutes because it is optimized to be fast and simple. Okay, so um, follow-up question. You now said that it can be used at roadblocks. So you've got a master's, or you're working on getting a master's degree. Um, 
do you think an uh, untrained police officer will be able to do this at a roadblock, do extraction, do chromatography, and then um, do an analysis of, of these results? Um, or would you rather have a specialist scientist working for them? Uh, thank you for the question. So firstly, the part that will be used in the roadblocks would be thin layer chromatography, which does not need the heavy lab med the heavy lab equipment like GCMS. So at a roadblock, it would be just a simple TLC. And then for further confirmatory tests, if there is a need for one, they could then take it to the lab for the HPLC and GCMS. But in terms of the training, there are now forensic scientists, which I believe could be of good use in the, in the test. Thank you so much, Tando Kutle. I'm going to welcome on stage now Renee Lowe from the Faculty of Humanities, and the title of her three-minute thesis is Reading the Forest for Interspecies Encounters and Multispecies Communities. We can just start it at the same time. Can you imagine a scenario where human and non-human exist in a peaceful environment within today's society? Perhaps you're thinking, I don't know. Haven't humans messed up their chances at harmonious coexistence with the natural world due to capitalist expansion, resource extraction, species extinction, and even climate change? Well, where do we go from here? Or have we reached the end of the line that pertains to a healthy relationship between humans and the natural world? Or might there be a small patch here and there within the disturbed landscapes of our present day world where life among ruins seems possible? My research aims to answer this question. My study investigates the forest as a site of commune for human and non-human inhabitants. I focus on two literary representations of the forest, found in Dalian Matias' novel, Circles in a Forest, where we see the fictional historical Naisna Forest, as well as South Africa's first ever Netflix original nature documentary, My Octopus Teacher, where we find an underwater kelp forest. Now, this film was made with great success when it was released in 2020, as it won the BAFTA and Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature, among many others. The objective of my study is to find the multiple ways in which the forest space extends and adds to the question around sustainable ecology by means of regenerative communities. Through a textual analysis and by drawing on post-colonial eco-critics from the Southern Hemisphere, I found how the forest space, a contaminated space, enables multi-species entanglements and interspecies encounters <laughs> that lead to rehabilitative and sensitizing possibilities. The terrestrial Nisna forest and the aquatic kelp forest engage in relational economies where reciprocity, vulnerability, and deep interconnection form the units of exchange among multi-species agents. I believe the forest space offers an alternative ways of practicing community-based ethics, which can be used to inspire sustainable assemblages where the human, the non-human, and the environment function through collaborative survival. Now, let me rephrase my first question. Can you imagine a scenario within a local space where a human and a non-human coexist within a disturbed landscape such as post-colonial South Africa? I certainly can. Thank you for listening. Forest always has a way of knowing. Do you want to just unpack a little bit on that? And yes. And connect it to what we just said now. Yes. So unfortunately, I was weary of whether you guys will be able to read the um, quote. But um, 
since my focus is the forest, um, I really unpack how the forest space enables these interspecies encounters and multi-species entanglements. And there is something that happens within the forests. It's a demarcated space. Um, and the thing is, we're not bound to a terrestrial Nisna forest. We are also looking at the aquatic kelp forest that offers a different world. It's kind of an up... Um, it's, it's an upturned forest where we have our bamboo kelp reaching upwards, but its roots are um, on the forest floor. So what I found within these two very vastly different forests is that they engage in community-based ethics that are different to our um, capitalist market economies where we see different units of exchange, where we don't focus on scarcity, but we focus on reciprocity and generosity amongst humans and non-humans. Presentations are incredible, truly innovative, thought-provoking, challenging. I'm really excited. You have your work cut out for you, judges. <laughs> Our next presenter um, here in the category of master's um, uh, participants will be Bafana Mavunda from the Faculty of Education, and his three-minute um, thesis is Error Analysis in Algebraic uh, Expressions. Bafana. The aim of this uh, investigation was to investigate the type of errors that learners make in algebraic expressions. In order for us to understand this, I want us to imagine the whole body of mathematics as a tree. At the bottom of this tree, we have the roots, uh, which will symbolize the arithmetic, which is the basics of numeracy. From there, it goes into the stem, which symbolizes algebra. Then it goes to the branches of mathematics. Now, by looking at this tree, we see the significant role that algebra plays in the whole body of mathematics. Hence, I saw it fit to conduct a study on algebraic expressions. In order to conduct this study, a mixed method research approach was used, whereby the study consisted of two stages. The first stage was the quantitative stage, where learners were given a test their answers were analyzed in order to quantify and, and to quantify and identify the errors. The second stage was uh, the qualitative stage, whereby semi-structured interviews were used in order to understand the reasoning behind the learner's errors. And the following were the findings of the study. These are the most frequent errors which were found. Factor, uh, fraction errors. Now, in the fraction errors, this is where learners failed either to add or to subtract fractions because they treated fractions as whole numbers. Non-recognition of common factors and factorization of trinomial errors. These ones were closely linked. This is where learners failed to identify or to factorize trinomials. Now, these two errors led to the next one, which is the conjoining of terms. Now, because they failed to identify these uh, uh, fractions, they ended up just adding everything up, which is to conjoin terms, meaning they added the terms which are not like terms. Meaning if you have two bananas plus three apples, they wanted to add that, which in, in fact will be just uh, two apples and then three bananas. The next one was uh, ex exponent errors. Now this is where they failed to understand the concept of exponentation. They take the exponent as a multiplication, meaning x squared, uh, x to the power two, they took it as x times two. And then misapplication of rules, this is where they, they used wrong applications, meaning where they were supposed to add, they multiplied. Now here, they were very hasty. When I asked them in the interviews, it was because maybe they, uh, they, they just was rushing into the, the answers. The last one was the replacing of letters by numeric values. Now this one, they made uh, just random picking numbers to to to, to they just pick numbers to replace the, the variables, mainly because they didn't understand the concept of a variable. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rafa. In the nick of time, <laughs> you can come this side. Okay. I'm going to request, <clears throat> please, um, from our presenters as well as our judges, that we speak into the mic just for the benefit of those who are not necessarily in the front and those joining us virtually. Do you have any questions? <clears throat> 
Um, thank you very much for your interesting uh, presentation. Was there any form of intervention uh, prior to your research? In other words, had students had any prior knowledge before you provided the test in a, as a form of your data collection? Thank you very much for that question. Uh, the prior knowledge that we took, this was done at the grade 10, 11, of which they have done this algebra from grade seven, grade eight, and grade nine. So already they had some sort of basis of algebra. Thank you. Um, just slightly different from what was asked. You said you used a mixed method. I just want a bit of clarity on that. Was it a mixed method or a mild method? Do you have a mixed method question? for this, or you just use two methods to try and augment your responses? Thank, thank you, Prof. I, I used two, <coughs> pardon, I used two uh, methods, um, meaning the quantitative and, and the qualitative. Thank you. Uh, so, I mean, what we're seeing is just errors, and where the fundamentals of the errors is it's actually hidden, perhaps to the person that's supposed to be. This is just traumatic for me because I was struggling with. <laughs> right, so, and now I'm perhaps getting it for the first time that you expect us to actually solve um, whatever that you call it when you haven't actually given us the course because the course is hidden. I'm, I'm just using your, your tree. Um, where do you think is the problem to explain the errors? Uh, thank you very much. Um, the problem to, to explain the errors, I think um, the problem here um, mostly is where by educators just mark either right or wrong on the learner's answers. Now here I'm proposing that instead of just marking wrong or right, try to check the learner's answers, try to identify the trend or the common errors so that when you uh, teach the next time, your teaching is aligned towards solving those errors. I'm not sure if that answers the question. I just have a comment, and it's more to the organizers to please get us post-traumatic counseling after <laughs> this, because um, it brings back some um, <coughs> really bad memories from school. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bafan. We have arrived at the final presenter in the master's category of our competition this morning. And that's going to be Toby Lendaba from the Faculty of Education. And Toby's topic will be an exploration into the teaching of the principles of an environmental awareness in grade 11 geography in, geography in the Pine Town District, Kwamashu Circuit, KwaZulu Natal. Toby Lem. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Toby Dendaba, and uh, my research um, in a nutshell was to uh, understand the reason why environmental education, as it is um, incorporated in the geography curriculum of grade 11, why is it not showing in learners' everyday lives and eventually in people's daily lives? Because there's a discrepancy between what is in the curriculum in terms of environmental education and how we live our daily lives. Um, so the research was mainly based on teachers instead of learners because um, 
the first thing in understanding the discrepancy is how it is taught and the challenges that teachers face when having to teach any type of content that has incorporated environmental education. So because geography is a broad subject that includes physical geography and human geography, each and every content has environmental education within it. Um, so that is basically the main aim, to understand why environmental education is not showing on the outside, like in our daily lives, um, but specifically on what learners are doing. So in the classroom, these are the challenges that um, I found from the five educators who were um, interviewed. I was only able to uh, um, interview five educators in a semi-structured interview um, setting due to COVID restrictions and such. Um, so the purple um, arrows indicate, I think, like we could just say challenges. So um, what the challenges that educators had in common were that many of their schools were under-resourced. So from something as basic and necessary as a textbook, we'd have an educator who has like 10 or, 20, 10 or 15 textbooks which are in good working conditions. And okay, um, socioeconomic and cultural factors, meaning that learners can only do what they are expected, to, what they see in the environment around them. Unsafe school environment, um, schools materials are getting lost. Um, a lack of formalized excursions, that one is a big one, because environmental education has to be physical, and it's not. There's no formalized excursions in the CAPS curriculum. So how can an educator be expected to teach environmental education without time? Okay, um, an inundated curriculum. The curriculum is packed. There's very little time to address um, all the aims of the curriculum. But the good things we found were that the socioeconomic and cultural factors produced eager learners and dedicated teachers who did things even beyond their um, challenges. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any questions from the judges? No? Probably. Mm -hmm. I mean, excuse, this is a really not so clever question. So, uh, what is not environment about geography? Sorry, sir? What is not environment about geography? Uh, I, I, I think I don't understand. Uh, um, so teaching, so, teaching okay. environmental education in the geography oh, creative. So what is not oh, environment okay. about geography? Okay. Um, the reason why, um, so basically, I think the way I understood it before going into the study, um, environmental education is just called EE or environmental education by itself. So because um, my research is based on the, the geography, like geography subject, I found that environmental education is incorporated into geography, um, meaning that even like when you maybe teach learners um, development, like in the grade 11 curriculum, there's a section of development in term three. So what elements are talking about sustainability and natural resources? So that part would be the environment because we also have the political, which is also affected by the environment. Um, so another one, if, you ha if we um, teach them physical geography in term one, in term two, so environmental education would be maybe the effects of humans on slopes. So I think that, so environmental education or and the environment is incorporated in different um, topics or contexts. In your conversation with the teachers, at what stage did you find um, out how, how teachers can see at what stage they incorporate environmental education into the, in the teaching of geography? I'm asking this because um, I'm aware that environmental education is supposed to be integrated in all the learning areas, basically including English, mathematics, all learning areas, just that your focus was in geography. Yes. 
and you are just indicating those topics where you could, example yourself, have identified at this point I'm doing environmental education. So according to your teachers, what was your findings with regard to that? At what stage do they find themselves actually doing um, the action of the integration? Okay. Um, well, of the five educators, I think the second participant was the, the one who detailed it very perfectly. And um, because he incorporated environmental education um, in geomorphology. So basically anything to do with slopes and rocks and such, he would take the learners outside because his school has a very large, like very large grounds. And he also made, um, uh, he said that himself, like he differentiated between the schools that he's, work, he's worked in. So he found that in rural schools, because the rivers were nearby, he was able to teach the concepts of river management easier than in an urban settlement or in an urban school. Whereas another educator who has not been um, exposed to such um, would talk about pollution, for example, like when he or she has to teach the part that concerns pollution specifically. That is the, the part where they discuss environmental education more. But I think there was, there was only one participant who actually um, had a different view of what environmental education was. Others based it mainly on pollution, urban settlements, and so on. Yes. Thank you. Um, what was the, the quartile of, of the the schools, um, that you actually okay. look at that um, yes. to see if there's a discrepancy between a Q1 and... Okay. Um, I am not sure about quartile, but there are um, no fee-paying schools in Guamashu Township. So, um, yes. So I don't know what quartile they are called. All right, we have reached the end of our master's presentations this morning, sorry, giving instructions and then for not following them myself. <laughs> we have reached the end of our presentations for the master's section this morning. Uh, we're going to take a small break, about five minutes, and, that, and then at 11.20 we will continue with our program. So very, very small break. <laughs> Thank you.
bacterial colonies and the fungal growth. This is called the zone of inhibition and indicates this bacteria's potential to be utilized as a biological control agent to manage this plant disease. Now, this fungal growth belongs to an economically important plant pathogen called Sclerotinia sclerotiorum. This pathogen can cause uh, severe yield losses in soybeans as well as a few other crops each year. Now, these results indicate the potential for indigenous microbial communities to be utilized as, as biofertilizers and biological control agents in sustainable soybean agriculture, but in sustainable agriculture in general. Furthermore, these results can help us to reduce our reliance on synthetic fertilizers and pesticides that pose a risk to our ecosystems as well as human health. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Do we have any questions from Vitaly? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I work in the GMO testing facility in the Faculty of Health. So. Uh, was it GM soybeans or was it wild type? It is uh, GM soybeans. Uh, since most of the soybeans, more than 95% of soybeans planted now are GMO. Um, so yes, they were. Any further questions? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Oh, there is a question. One it's, it's a quick oh. one. So when, when no are we making our first millions? Uh, sorry? When are we making our first millions? <laughs> <laughs> Let's give it a year or two. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. We're going to move on to our next um, presenter. That's going to be Corinne Forey from the Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Sciences. And her thesis is, until we win, combating rotavirus with an alternative vaccine. Rotavirus is the most common cause of serious diarrhea in children, leading to severe dehydration and death. And because this is often accompanied by profuse vomiting, oral rehydration therapy is not an effective treatment at all. In fact, there is no treatment for rotavirus infections. The only way to prevent serious rotavirus illness is vaccination. And the vaccines are lifesavers. Since they've been introduced, rotavirus-related deaths have decreased from half a million a year to approximately 128,000. But those numbers are still far too high. While the vaccines are impactful, they don't work as well as they should in the countries that need them the most, specifically developing countries. And there are various possible reasons for this. For example, these are oral vaccines, meaning the immune response needs to happen in the intestines. So there could be factors in the guts of children from developing countries interfering with the immune response. These vaccines are also very expensive, making them unattainable for many countries. There are also live attenuated vaccines, so there are some safety concerns. We need more affordable vaccines that work better in these high burden countries. And that is why we are working on developing a new type of vaccine called a subunit vaccine. And for that, we are looking at a rotavirus protein called VP6. Now, VP6 is a very unique protein. Under the right conditions, it aggregates to form increasingly complex structures we call nanotubules. And these nanotubules have been shown to induce very good immune responses that protect you from rotavirus infections from various rotavirus strains, something not always seen with the oral vaccines. But for a vaccine, we need a system that will provide us with enough VP6 to use sustainably. So we have genetically engineered yeast to produce the VP6 for us. We grow the yeast in bioreactors, which is a way of maintaining and sustaining the yeast while they grow so that they can provide us with enough VP6. Our goal is to harvest and purify the VP6 so that we can use it for safety and efficacy studies. This vaccine candidate will be more affordable than the current vaccine candidates, and because subunit vaccines are administered as an injection, it will overcome the factors thought to be responsible for the current lower efficacy seen with the oral vaccines. If this is successful, this will be a game changer in our fight against rotavirus. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this will be injectable? Thank you, yes, this will be an injectable vaccine. Okay, so um, usually with the oral ones, it's, it's better um, accepted by the community. And um, having seen results from, from Ghana, 
especially with the rotavirus, um, is it not maybe, how will you overcome that, that gap of injecting something versus taking it orally? Um, thank you, yes, that is a very a good question. Especially now we've seen with COVID, there is quite a bit of vaccine hesitancy all the way around. And with the, um, I think it is um, Rota, um, Rota Tech that's been now recently introduced into Ghana and you know it, it's been working so well and yes the, the the population in Ghana will be a little bit more resistant to accepting the vaccines but I do think if we approach them in a way of educating them properly they we will be able to convince them that this is the better way to go because especially since the oral vaccines they don't provide as well protection in upper africa so we need to be able to explain to them yes you know the oral vaccine is nice but you know it won't be able to protect you as nicely as the the injection and yes it's going to hurt it's not going to be nice but this will you know provide some better protection so we really have to you know educate them a little better. I think that really is the only way. We just have to be patient. Yeah, and education, I think that's the best way. Yeah, thank you. That's what the doctor said. It's, what the, it's exactly what the doctor it, ordered. It, it will hurt, but it's going to help. <laughs> um, the worry is that uh, I hope this is not the yeast yeast that I, that I get from ShopRite because it's well, probably well, yeah, actually. <laughs> um, the, the, you say the alternative. What is currently and what's not working with the current? Yes, thank you very much. So the current vaccines are live attenuated vaccines. So they're live rotaviruses that's just been attenuated. So for example, they have um, a bovine backbone. So it's for example, a pig rotavirus that's just been modified that they're using You know, for humans. It still gives the same immune response that will still give you some kind of protection against the human rotavirus strains. Or they've just been attenuated in cell culture to not give you as bad of um, you know, the symptoms that a normal rotavirus infection would. So the current ones are actual live rotaviruses that's just been weakened. But it's actually a problem, especially if you're immune compromised, you can actually get sick from, you know, using these vaccines. But also we have a problem with some vaccine escape variants where they are reassorting with the field strains and things like that. So there are a lot of safety concerns with the current vaccines. And so subunit vaccines don't have that problem. They can't give you an actual rotavirus infection if you're immune compromised. You can vaccinate younger children. You can even vaccinate some older people. There isn't a problem that you're going to have vaccine escape variants. It's, there's, a, there's so many more advantages to using subunit vaccines than using, using actual viruses um, in the vaccines. Uh, thank you very much. Let me just follow up. Maybe I might have used this. Has this already been... Yeah, in a simple term, I would say implemented. Has it been done yet? Um, for, for rotavirus specifically? That's right. Um, so there is actually a BV6 based vaccine in the pipeline, but it hasn't gone to clinical trials yet. There is a, um, a subunit vaccine, but it's based on one of the other proteins. It's based on one of the spike proteins that is in clinical trials, and it's showing some very good results. But on the market at the moment, there is only um, the oral vaccine. So there aren't subunit vaccines available on the market currently for rotavirus. Okay. Thank you very much, Corinne. Our next presenter is going to be Constance Mutsizi from the Faculty of Education and of Economic and Management Sciences. Sorry about that. <laughs> and her title is Public Financial Management Reforms and Service Delivery at the Northern Cape Department of Health. Public financial management reforms are initiatives and strategies implemented by government to primarily... Sorry? Apologies. Okay. Let me just quickly... Okay, let's try it one more time. I was so ready. Let's try it one more time. Okay, ready when you are. Public financial management are initiatives and strategies primarily implemented to enhance service delivery. Since the advent of democracy, the South African government has prioritized the implementation of these reforms, and at institutional and provincial level, the Northern Cape Department of Health has implemented these reforms with the core objective of enhancing service delivery. 
Yet, despite these reforms, service delivery in this province remains utterly poor, thus raising a question. If the government spends millions of rands each year implementing these reforms, why aren't they improving? What creates the gap between the two? A qualitative study was used in this research study. I interviewed 15 program and financial managers directly responsible for the implementation of these reforms. The study identified key, five key aspects responsible for this disconnect. Firstly, Political commitment was found lacking in areas where political heads are the drivers of the reforms. Secondly, there is poor administrative leadership within the department, characterized by lack of accountability and no consequence management. Leaders do as they please and get away with it. There is a lack of skills and competencies for many reasons, but shockingly, over 30% of the current employees have been employed based on political affiliations and not their skills. Then there are poor internal control systems. This is made worse by the poor infrastructure and the poor technological advances in the department. Moreover, the department's reluctancy to implementing the recommendations of the Auditor General. And lastly, the misalignment between the approved budget and the implemented budget. And this, of course, is caused by the direct intention to commit corruption. Ladies and gentlemen, there is nothing wrong with our policies or our reforms. The problem is with the people managing it, because South Africa has the best policies or one of the best policies in the entire world. What we need at the moment are leaders who not only understand the importance of service delivery, but those that respect us, the citizens, and value their role in providing us with quality and value for money service delivery. I thank you. I think the second take worked better. <laughs> thank you so much, Constance. Do we have any questions from the judges? <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I just like that she, she had to say so herself, right? So, <laughs> um, if you just go back to that one slide, there's a, there's a section that speaks to the disconnect. I was just going one back here. There's a section that speaks to disconnect, and I see that the two gentlemen, the one oh. in red and the one in blue. Um, yeah, just speak to the disconnect. Thank you. Okay. All right. So the disconnect here is that. Can I please have the slide? It will be better to. Yes. The red man is the reforms. And then. Um, the plug is service delivery. The disco these two people, or these two concepts, have to be brought together in order for us to receive quality or value for money service delivery. But now, the people handling the reforms, which are the government officials, are the ones pulling the plug and creating the disconnect that we have between the reforms and service delivery. Where's that presentation on where's the auditor? <laughs> <laughs> they don't. <laughs> Next question. Thank you very much for, for that. Um, yeah, as, as part of my lifelong le uh, learning, I did a, a short course at the business school in um, ethics and governance. And there's some of these policies that's that I really didn't know of because it's not being implemented anywhere. So thank you for this. And I think this is really important for this to be communicated up to, to government as well, to say it's not only having good policies, but actually implementing them and monitoring them mm -hmm. and actually doing something like the Zondo Commission now doing, saying, but these, these Are they things. they implementing? Yeah, the implementation. So yeah. thank you very much for this. It's really thank you. exciting stuff. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Constance. Um, we're going to move on now to our next presenter, which is Ronel Klein Hans from the Faculty of e Economic and Management Sciences. I'm really committed to saying education today. <laughs> and her title is The Career Construction of Performing Artists. Ronel. Tell me when you are ready. 
What did you miss the most during the COVID-19 lockdown? Perhaps going out with friends and family, to the theater, perhaps listening to a jazz ensemble, or even just enjoying your kids' annual school play. We missed the live performing arts. Now, the performing arts are one of the oldest professions, and they've endured many hardships yet survived. So what is it that gives performing artists this ability to, like the mythical sea creature Proteus, change shape and be flexible amidst the changing environment? And that is what I intended to find out. Now, in the performing arts, there are various strategies and things that are impacting them, and I wanted to check on these things. I wanted to see how they construct themselves, how they construct their careers, and how they make sense of their world. And to do this, I used a qualitative, exploratory, descriptive case study design. I interviewed 19 participants using the career interest profile online, and then I did an in-depth qualitative interview with them, and afterwards, thematical analysis and four main findings emerged. Number one, being a performing artist was not just something they chose, it was a core value ingrained in their career and self-identity. Number two, they experienced many hardships throughout their lives, especially being bullied and rejection from various systemic levels. Number three, they had various strategies to deal with these challenges, such as spirituality, creativity and career adaptability. Now, career adaptability refers to this ability to take responsibility, be proactive in their career development, and to look for opportunities and having the confidence to go for them. And then lastly, they had this absolute creative urge to convert the pain and suffering they've experienced into hope, into purpose, and into a making a social contribution on and off stage. So, as the 21st century increasingly poses new challenges, such as employment transitions and career instability, we do not have to act like the players in Shakespeare's well-known play, as you like it, passively portraying these roles that, the, that the, the world has given us on the stage of life. No, we can go and learn from performing artists to have hope, to have a purpose, and to actively impact our society. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any questions from the judge? Thank you very much. Yes. How many of your 19 participants actually thought about changing careers? A lot. No, because the time when I did the, the data gathering, it was in COVID. So they had extreme hardships. But something that was also very evident was that many of the, them said, and that's about the career, adaptability, the career adaptability said, that you know what, you had to think about COVID even before it struck, because in the arts, you have to have various revenues of income. So going back and saying, our poor artists, is not good enough. You should have thought about that before the time. And that is why I think this is such a, a, a valid case. And because we are all actually sitting now in exactly the same situation that many artists has done for the past how many centuries. And that's where we can learn so much from them. How did they do this? And how did they survive? I mean, yes. Uh, it, Prof, in his, in his, um, in his talk, he's, he spoke about employability mm. right, as, mm. as, as one key attribute as far For as sure. being. Um, how do you, how do, what is hope? What is purpose? When, when you are living in an, in, in an uncertain, in an you uncertain don't even know world. What, is going to, what is going to happen. You know, there's, there's, it's good words, but no, what does sure. it really mean? For sure. Now, hope in this sense was, first of all, and that is what they've done, is using their craft to transition from their pain into something that gave them the purpose, that gave them the reason for going on because they believe they are making a difference and believe they are. Um, and interesting, they not only did this on stage through their craft, whatever it was, drama or whatever, but also in other non-related activities. And um, then together with that, creativity, 
and not just in terms of a craft-related activity, being a musician or whatever, but being creative in terms of your decision-making, in terms of problem-solving, those type of creativity together with adaptability that goes together with the employability. Um, to be able to adapt, to be proactive, to take responsibility for my behaviour, seek opportunities and take control of my career. So um, that, that was very evident in, in these participants. Um, just a quick one, mm. just for my own curiosity. Yes. You said you collected this um, during the COVID pandemic. Mm. And the rumor has it that there was actually quite a bit of corruption with the system that was geared towards the artists, the performing artists. It was in that, that time. Yeah, did that and come up at all? In your yes, study? because that is why one of the, the, the struggles I mentioned was um, they've experienced bullying, but also rejection. Now, rejection was not only um, from at being at school where we know the RT types a lot of times get rejected, but it was also on a systemic level. They've experienced rejection from government level, not supporting them, uh, funding getting lost. Um, and that is where they've experienced some of this rejection. That's a pretty way of putting it, to say <laughs> that was. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I mean, let's, let's, let's move out of COVID, right? All right as, yeah. as, as one context. Yeah. If, if you could just imagine this in a, in a normal, without COVID kind of mm. context, would hope pepper still remain? Yeah, yeah, because that is what it is about construction. When we work, because we work from a counseling, career counseling perspective, and that is many times, even in the transition session where people in the mid 40, where they struggle, that is usually in that career transition session where they struggle with purpose. They've done what they had to do and what now? And many times, that's where they also make career transitions, to find something that gives them purpose. Um, um, thank, thank you very much. Mm. Um, if you would have done this study under different conditions, in mm. other words, um, not COVID, not COVID right. um, would you expect um, the same findings? Mm. Mm. Because COVID is just another struggle they, fought, they, mm -hmm. they had. That's right. Usually these are the typical things they in any case have to deal with. I do think COVID just exemplified it much more. But these are the things that they, people wanting them to, to um, appear for free. It's marketing. That's the general thing. When you have to go and sing at a performance, it's exposure. Everyone will know you. That doesn't pay the bills. Um, so it's the typical things of not, not having security and employment. That is a protein environment. That is what we talk about. It's flexible. It's changing the whole time. You don't have. In, the, in, in overseas, in Europe, they've got the companies that's employing musicians. We don't have that in South Africa. Um, so they have to create their own employment. Yeah. <laughs> oh, let's not go even there. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ornell. We are now going to move into a part of the program that uh, Prof. Witness spoke about, the hybrid uh, part. So we are going, our next presenter is Hendra Muller. She's joining us um, online. And her three-minute thesis title is Mirror, Mirror on the Wall. Henry, can you hear us? I can. The, the, the better question is, can you hear and oh, see me? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, we can. Wonderful. Okay, perfect. Just please give us a second, quickly. Yeah, just hang on. <laughs> Just to let you know, it's not less nerve-wracking on this side of the computer screen. <laughs> All right. No, but it's going to be okay. Hendra, <laughs> okay. we're just... Um, sharing your presentation on the screen. Oh, perfect.
Okay, Hendra, ready when you are. Hendra, are you still with us? Am I muted? Are you still with us? Can you hear me, Hendra? Hi everyone. So it, you know, as the technology grows, <laughs> it's also helping us develop as well, as much as we develop it. So we're just having a slight technical issue with the audio for Henra's presentation. If we could just give us a few moments to get that right and then we will be on the way.
Kendra? Can you hear us now? You can just click it, and I should proceed. Hendra, can you say something, please? I'm texting. Okay, can we make it um, a bit louder, just so the judges can hear as well? Okay, can you say something else, Sandra? Sorry about this. Yeah, I, I, I can see she's speaking, but we can't. Should we continue with other presentations and then come back? Okay, but we still need to use this like talk to the judge.
Porsche Kunis maar dit gaan we betekenen dat we een afdruk behalve de koning van de kant Um, sê gaf vir my, kan ons nog steeds recording optel as ons haal laptop in plak? Should I use my laptop? Weet jy wat? Kan ons dit so doen? Ok. Waar is die auxiliary kabel? Hier is ons jou ook so dat hy kom. Kan ek nog gaan uitraak? Ja, plek. Ja. Lank is hy. Just have to have to put to Kom ons Amit gaan daar? Kom ons Amit gaan daar? Kijk, ik kan eens gaan hoog proberen. Kom eens gaan hoog proberen. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Woehoe! Hi, can you hear us? Hi. Ok, Ria Betsy, you can just indicate... Everybody is as anxious as I am to hear my... We are very excited now. That's what we are. Excited to hear you. <laughs> I think the Wi-Fi. I don't know who's it. All right. Henry, can you hear us? I don't think she can hear us. Henry, can you hear us? Ah, that's that. <laughs> okay. Mm. Please type for her to start presenting. That we can hear her, but we can't. She can't hear us. Tasting, tasting. Ah. <laughs> I don't even know. No, she can't hear us. She can't hear us at all. <laughs> what do you have in the hawk clank? Hawk clank? Eh? Can it be as um, the club at the heart to go? Would us money in my clank in this? So that would unusual. I don't know my clank in this. I think so. I think I need to talk into the laptop. Mm. I cannot hear you, Betsy. I cannot hear you at all. And my speaker is switched to 100% volume. Should I speak? 
Can you hear us now? Henra? Can the audience see my slide? Oh, there we go. Let's see. If... Hi, Henra, can you hear us? I can hear you. Yay! Can you see my slide? <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So I want to reintroduce you because I think people might have forgotten. <laughs> and we're very sorry for that delay, Henry. I know you were very nervous in the beginning. This couldn't have made it easier. And thank you all for your patience as well. So this is Henra Muller from the Faculty of Health Sciences. And she is joining us to present her three-minute thesis titled Mirror, Mirror on the Wall. Henra. Mirror on the Wall. We all know that. Just to make for one, that when you're looking scored by either a motor vehicle, salt, cancer, or even burns, a constant horrible reminder of your feelings of anxiety, depression. But all is not lost. There is hope. The Center for Rapid Prototyping and Manufacturing 3D prints facial implants, also known as a prosthesis, to restore your original scans, better known as CAT scans, of a patient's face are used to manufacture such a prosthesis. If these images are not, it may result in a poorly prosthesis, causing more CT scans, additional radiation, possibly surgery or trauma to the patient. Use the best fitting prosthesis the first time. CT scans were not available. Um, of stereolithography files, ST been ranked by an expert team Let's do this. If you can't measure it, you can't. we applied a novel method to measure CT image quality. I extract. Henra, can you hear me? Sorry about this. Henra? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Yes, I hear you. Okay, yes. awesome. Sorry, Clem. So sorry. I'm even defaulting to Sesotho now. <laughs> there is there's a challenge with our with the connection on this particular platform, the Blackboard platform. So what we um, proposing is that we please call you in on the Microsoft Teams instead, and then you'll speak after our last speaker. We only have two more speakers. Oh, I wonder if you can you heard. We only have two more speakers after you. So as soon as um, those have completed, we will uh, give you an opportunity to please present because we're missing out on key parts of your presentation at the current moment um, due to uh, Blackboard uh, connectivity issues. Is that all right, please? I'm asking with all humility. Henra? <gasps> what is it? She can't hear me. Henda, can you hear me? Is she disconnected? Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay, should we move on? All right. All right. What we've, uh, what has happened here is, has really built our resilience as a group. <laughs> <laughs> we will remember one another for this particular moment. All right. It's patience in a year. You know. I want to move on to our next presenter from the Faculty of Health Sciences as well. That is going to be Dr. Michael Pinar. Dr. Michael is going to uh, present to us on machine learning models for pediatric critical illness. <laughs> I have the, the dubious pleasure of trying to convince you that computers are good things now. <laughs> uh, okay, let me just quickly try my presentation. That's not on me. I'm just quickly trying to get your presentation. That was like a seance. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yo, tell me when I can start. Um, okay, wait. Wait, I just need to reset the time, Michael. Uh, that's not mine. Uh, okay, let me know when you're ready. Uh, I'm as ready as I'm going to be, I think. <laughs> okay, you can go. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, exciting opportunity to share my research with you. So, um, 32 in 1,000 South African children born every year uh, will die before their fifth birthday. Uh, and a part of addressing that is ensuring that these children have access to timeless um, involvement of critical team environments and critical team specialists in their treatment. But what we've seen in the literature is that children follow complex pathways from primary health care, um, pre-hospital settings, and they're seen by people who are not immediately versed in pediatric critical care. And this leads to significant delays in their arrival in the critical care environment and their resuscitation, which leads to increased risk of death and increased severity of illness in the ICU. So we envisioned using a machine learning platform um, on a mobile health platform to allow critical or patients or providers dealing with critically ill children to identify them early and allow the activation of the resuscitation and referral pathway early. So to do this, um, we used a mixed method study where we first gathered clinical domain knowledge um, from experts as well as the literature, and then we moved on into a cohort of 1,000 um, patients presenting to hospital um, over the previous year. We developed mainly artificial neural network models as our predictive model for this task, and we tested them um, on this 1,000 patient cohort. So the models demonstrated excellent performance in being able to differentiate between children who are and are not critically ill. And these are clearly demonstrated by the receiver operating curve area, which is uh, greater than 0 0.8 for all nine of the models we developed. Um, but what was more important was to look at the specific performance in the patients who are critically ill. And that's what we see in the precision recall curve at the top, which specifically focuses on what we call the positive class. So what we concluded from this is that when we look at these models, we need to, one, consider the costs of misidentifying children who are critically ill versus the costs of identifying children who are not critically ill as critically ill. And we envision a nested set of models where we incorporate a model like this, as well as another almost um, multiple layered um, net of predictive models that protect patients throughout their admission to hospital and the healthcare process. Thank you. Thank you so much. The other any questions from the Kasha? I'm going to call upon now um, Malifezani Petras Lengwala from the Faculty of Education. Malifezani is going to present to us on exploring national senior certificate examination irregularity and misconduct, a question of accountability. There's been reports of uh, examination irregularities in uh, NSC uh, senior certificate examinations. In 2020, uh, mathematics paper two uh, was leaked in one of the coastal schools in Natal, in KwaZulu Natal. Since principals, examination officials, and learners have responsibility to ac accountability to sustain the credibility of these examinations. Report, these reports immediately uh, inform us that there is accountability. Now, uh, the following questions 
uh, were posed. Do, what, what processes do a Department of Education lay down to ensure the integrity of national senior certificate examinations? How these processes are communicated as vital, as vital dimensions of accountability? How these processes are enacted at school level? According to theory of accountability, can you really say that principals, examination officials, and learners have responsible for accountability to maintain the integrity of national senior examinations? Now, um, the following objectives were formulated to explore processes and procedures uh, laid down by the Department of Education to ensure the integrity of uh, national senior certificate examinations. To ensure how these processes are communicated as vital dimensions in accountability. To ensure how these processes are enacted at school. To ensure how principals, examination officials and learners are accountable for the integrity of national senior certificate. Now, this study focused on theory of accountability and pragmatic research paradigm. Uh, qualitative research was conducted in this study and mixed methods, uh, sorry, uh, multiple methods were used for data collection. Now, in one of the interviews, uh, one of the principals indicated that uh, question papers are received by the principals at the school and immediately be stored at the uh, stone, strong room before exams are written. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just interested in finding out what would be, even if you just take us through your key, f you know, just one key finding of this study. You took us through what was the study all about. What would you say is at least one key finding of the study? Yeah, the finding of the study is that uh, question papers are delivered to school and received by the school principals. And according to procedures and processes laid down by the department, the principal, uh, after being trained, should immediately uh, take these question papers into the strong room for anybody, uh, should, so that anybody should not tamper with them. Thank you, Nadi. Um so there's irregularity and misconduct, there's accountability as, as your key theoretical, uh, I think, disposition you mentioned. Um, from what you said now, as your key findings, how does that loosely translate into um, what you would have actually used as a baseline to, to foreground your argument on accountability? Uh, maybe I didn't understand the question clearly, Linda. could you just repeat? So the key finding that you shared with us now, how does it relate with the accountability theory? Okay, thank you very much for the question. Um, this key finding, finding relates with accountability in the sense that principals and examination officials, including learners who are writing metric, should have a responsible, responsibility to ac accountability so that there should be no uh, examination irregularities and misconduct. As we always hear from the radio or from the media that learners were caught cop uh, copying, learners were caught with question papers uh, in their WhatsApp, and the paper has not yet been written.
Oh, okay. I feel like I'm seeing some of you for the first time. Hi. <laughs> We're going to try and get Henra Mueller back. Thank you very much for your patience with this particular aspect and technical glitch. You know, um, there were test, the, the program was tested and, and, and everything ran smoothly, but sometimes you can test and test and then, you know, um, the goblins get you anyway. <laughs> but let's try and get Henra back, please, just, you know, for fairness and so that she can complete her presentation and the judges can have the full scope of her work as well. Thank you. There was lovely music earlier. Incredible. I think, I think that would help us through. That would help us through. I also have an, I'm a piano mix, if that will liven up the mood.
videographer has one. So I'm here, I'm with you, and you can tell me when to start. Okay. Okay, timer, are you ready? Okay. okay, just give us a second to get the timer right. <laughs> okay, the timer is ready, ready when you are. Okay, mirror, mirror on the wall. We all know this fairy tale, but just imagine for one minute that when you look into the mirror, your face has been deformed and scarred by either a motor vehicle accident, assault, cancer, or even burns. A constant horrible reminder of your feelings of anxiety, depression, and social rejection. But all is not lost. There is hope. The Center for Rapid Prototyping and Manufacturing at the Central University of Technology, 3D prints facial implants, also known as a prosthesis, to bring your face back to its original form. Computer tomography scans, better known as CAT scans, of the patient's face are used to manufacture such a prosthesis. If these CT images are not accurate, the prosthesis could fit poorly, it may result in more CT scans more radiation, possibly more surgery, and more trauma to the patient. In my study, I wanted to find the CT scan settings that will produce the best fitting prosthesis the first time. Because CT scans are not available, stereolithography files, SPL, were ranked by an expert team using a specially designed rubric to score the visibility of special anatomical reference points of the skull. It is a known saying, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. We applied a novel method to measure CT image quality. I extracted information from the best ranking SPLs, which are then used to scan a specialized phantom, a cat fan phantom. By doing this, we could now measure the, uh, the image quality through SMARI software. The top CT scans were then tested on a human-like phantom and later confirmed on a dry skull, um, which is even closer to the real world setting. We completed the loop by converting the best scans to the original STL for the expert team to rank once again. Our optimal set of CT settings were identified, taking the radiation dose into consideration, which should always be kept as low as possible. This final set of optimal CT settings can now be recommended to clinicians, sorry, to clinicians across the world for the scanning of patients who require a prosthesis. Mirror, mirror on the wall. No more tears, as I look beautiful after all. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a participants will attest that research is not always easy. Even getting your message across is not always easy. Thank <laughs> you for your passion. Thank you so much, Henry. Thank you very much for being such a sport and being, remaining so patient throughout. I'm just going to ask um, the judges if there are any questions. No, there are no questions from the judges either, um, Henry. So thank oh, okay. you. Thank you so much. Thank that you very much. I will I join the... Thank you so much. Bye-bye, right. everybody. Okay. Bye. Sure. Yay, us. <laughs> well done, well done, well done to the team. Thank you very much. Well, one thing the center can be proud of is that it has problem-solving, creative, innovative, um, what is it, uh, staff members and, and colleagues and students as well. So at this particular juncture, we've reached finally the end of the PhD presentations, which would then mean we've reached the end of the presentations as well. Uh, we're going to move on uh, and take some time now to, for, to allow some time for score calculation by the judges. And then afterwards, we're going to have an announcement of our winners and a vote of thanks by Prof. And we will have something to eat together. <laughs> All right, just a bit of patience, please, just for the score calculation. Yeah? If there is, you know what, honestly. <laughs>
we can together as a team. Something is <laughs> team building.
you so much. Thank you so much. Just as it does, but it's not the first button. But it's all right. That's all right. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. So we've reached the conclusion almost of our program. I wouldn't let you guys go without knowing. Um, and so I'm just going to read out to you and remind everyone that I'm not going to be one of the suffering. So for the master's category, the master's second runner-up gets 4,000 rands. The master's first runner-up gets 6,000 rands. And the master's winner and the master's winner will get a walk of 8,000 rands. It's not a bad weekend to go with it. Thank you, Mosa. Um, we want to keep people waiting a little bit. We'll start with the other stuff, that's the interesting stuff. Um, I think you all agree that our MC did a fantastic job today, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Can we give you a round of applause? Please? <laughs> is it a good of appreciation? Ah, this is for you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Um, I know you want to hear what transpired, but before we that, we had the very important people here that took time out of their busy schedules to be with us today. And we'd like to, like to pass the small tokens of appreciation for the time you took to be with us today. Thank you so much, the judges. And again, I know you want to know who has won what, but before we even go today, it's important to emphasize that everybody who presented today is a winner. Um, the, the, the markings and everything is irrelevant. The fact that you are here, that on its own, is very important. And as a result, we are giving each presenter a certificate of participation before we get to the, um, to the overall winners. Um, if you can just come and collect your certificates. Uh, Ruth? Uh, <laughs> Bernadette? Sorry, sorry, you did come back. You were too quick. <laughs> Remy. And then our PhD participants, Alec. Thank you. 
Michael? Right. And then the last part that I'm quite sure you, were all, you are all eagerly waiting for. We'll start with the master's category. Our second runner up is Renny Law. Our second runner-up is any church. Yeah. And the winner in the master's category is Jane Marie Groove. And then we'll move over to the PhD category. Our second runner-up is Alec Edwards. Wow. And our first runner-up is Renéo Kleinhans. Kleinman, Winner in the PhD category is Constance Motisi. So just a reminder again that um, then what it means is at the national three minute competition that will be on the 28th of this month, uh, our representatives there will be Constance and Ronell. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I think this brings us to the end of the program, but before we do that, I need to thank the whole staff of the Center for Graduate Support again for doing this, but in particular, there are some specific individuals that really drove this. It started way before with the faculty competition, even before that, with the planning that we had to do with the whole faculty reps and everybody else. And the people that really drove this is one, Ms. Riyabes Omabine, if we can give you. And then also Mrs. Daniela Vessels, I'm not sure if she's here. Yes, she's here at the back there. <laughs> and then I think somebody who started the process but then had to go on maternity leave, we need to acknowledge her in her absence as well. That's Mrs. Tepiso Mokwena. <laughs> I think my job is done. Um, <laughs> we have got it for you outside. But for the judges, who we have got it's four years old, but not outside. You will follow us, and we'll show you where yours are. <laughs> um, I think you guys, the audience, have been amazing. You managed to withstand all the technical difficulties that we had to endure. We really appreciate that. And to the participants, once again, congratulations to everybody. Yeah. May we have a lovely day. Thank you.
Thank you. <laughs>